Hey guys, it's Steve. I just wanted to go over some very simple numbers on a house hack or if you're looking to use a conventional loan. I don't know, a house hack is an extremely easy way to get started if you can first come up with the capital and the discipline of saving and get started in real estate investing. So the most important thing first, I think before you look at a property is the 1% rule. That is very easy, right? So if we have the price at 250, 250, right? We want to hit our rent at a minimum of 2,500 a month. On this theoretical property, it's at 2,400. So just by that, without looking at anything else, it is just slightly under 1%. Typically, at least in this market here, in Mass, in Worcester County, you want to look for at least 1%, which means the rent does, matter of fact, higher than the purchase price. For this to also be good, the higher it is, like if it's 2,400, I mean, I'm sorry, 2,600, 2,700, 2,800, that will just make it stronger in general. So first step, number one, look at the 1% rule. Next, how much does it actually cost to get into a house hack? So if you're looking to use FHA, that's typically 3.5% down, right? So what is 3.5 of 250? Let's just take a quick look. So that's around 87.50. So that is your technical down payment. But you also need to include closing cost. So your closing costs on 250 are likely going to be between, I would say, 4K and 6K. So your out-of-pocket is roughly 13K to 15K, out-of-pocket, right? So that is your out-of-pocket expense. What are you going to be paying on a monthly basis? What we call is the PITI, your principal, interest, your taxes, and insurance. These are non-negotiable. You're going to be paying every month. So if you're putting 3.5% down, roughly the rates are around 4.5% right now, you're going to be paying around $12.50 a month. That is just your mortgage, right? Your mortgage is $12.50. That will adjust also depending on the rate. If the rate goes up, your mortgage might go a little bit higher as well. But the rates are historically low. I mean, only 4.5% now it is extremely low. Next, your interest. This is what you will be paying unless you go conventional financing. It's one of the negatives of FHA, but essentially, if you can get into a property, or in this case, between nine, I mean, I'm sorry, 13 and 16,000, you're gonna be paying this $200 in mortgage insurance for the life of the FHA loan. One really cool thing is down the line, once you hit that 20% equity, you can refinance at FHA, go conventional, and even use the product again, the FHA product again. But just for our sake now, our two expenses, we have our principal at $1,250, and we have our interest at $200. So right now, our payment is $1,450. In addition, you're going to be paying taxes on the property. In this area, I estimated around $300 per taxes. This is dependent on the assessed value of the property as well. If you do get a property that is a little bit lower than 250, it might be a little bit lower, it might be higher. It depends on each individual city or town based on, based on the tax rate on the assessed value. But it's just a good number. We just use 300, a nice, easy number. And finally, our insurance. Our insurance is our final thing on the property we're gonna pay in our PITI. So my monthly payment, I estimate around 150. It might be lower for owner-occupied, but this is for an owner-occupied. It could be a little bit lower, but you're gonna to need to call and get quotes, right? Our total number for our PITI is 1250, 200, 300, and 150. That's our monthly regardless, right? So that's actually 1450, 1550, that's actually 1900 bucks, okay? So we have $1,900 in our first PITI. And our income coming in is 2400 when it's fully rented out. If you plan on living there, then this rent it will change to 1600 but you're living there, right? So you can even say, I'm paying about 300 bucks a month to live in my property, which is gonna be a lot cheaper than rent. So after we have our price, we have our PITI, our next is our expenses. I broke this down very easily. It could be a lot more complex, but the basics, the four main expenses you will have, your vacancy. Vacancy is when you have a property vacant, how quickly can you turn it? Obviously, the quicker you can turn it, find a quality tenant, the less you're going to be paying that it's vacant. 
and every day it's vacant, you're essentially losing money. So I put 5% at low and 10% at high. But if you think about it like this, 10% on high would be 240, and that's times 12. So you have 2880 allocated for vacancy, right? And if your units rent for 800 bucks, that means one out of those three units could be vacant for around, I mean, three and a half months. That's 14 weeks. So that is a huge cushion. I would almost recommend 5%. That's going to be cut in half. That's 1440. That's still six weeks vacant property. If you need to do a lot of repairs, it's possible a six week turnover. But if you did inherit quality tenants and they are leaving and you are kind of advertise it and screen, that 5% might be good for you. It also depends on if you're managing the property yourself, right? Because you will be finding a tenant, which is essentially the number one thing you need to do is know your tenant class and know your tenant screening process when they come in. So we have five and 10% for vacancy. CapEx, we also have five and 10%. This will depend on the building's age as well. What are the major systems in the house look like? How will the roof and the siding last updated? What about the boiler, the hot water heaters, any major expense over time? So you don't get shocked when in five years you need to replace a boiler, say it's 5,800 bucks. You don't think your career is over because you have to spend that money. You know what? You've been saving it over time, so it's okay. That's my expense. Boom, I'll pay it. But I did allocate the same amount, which would still be the same amount on a monthly and a yearly basis. Yearly basis. All right, next is property management. So this is if you are going to have property manager manage property. Typically, they can charge between 8 and 12%. I rounded it up to 10%. This, if you live close to the property, or if you live in the property, I would totally do property management. What it means is you're responsible for all repairs, and you're responsible for keeping everything clean, sanitary, and you're responsible for any tenant issues. I would totally recommend doing it just because it's a great experience if you are getting started. You may feel kind of odd living next to your tenants or in the same building, but over time, as long as you are respectful and there should not be many problems. But that comes down to if you're inheriting tenants, are you screening them? And what's your process to screen tenants as well? So this is about 10%. If you are investing out of state or investing an hour, two hours away, it's highly, I mean, you're gonna be doing property management. You're not gonna to wanna to drive two hours away to the property. So I allocated 10%. And finally is repairs. So these are smaller repairs that'll happen. I allocated five and 10% as well. This could be things such as if you are doing your own Snow in Massachusetts, you know, you're buying, you're buying salt, um, you're buying sand, you're doing landscaping, you're doing the driveway. Anything like that is a small repair. Fixing out light bulbs in the common area. Um, if you are doing painting, overturning a unit, the cost of turnover unit, I would consider that a repair. Fixing anything with the toilet, having a plumber come in, fixing anything with an appliance, if you are having appliances come in, or if you're inheriting appliances, I consider these repairs. So. Overall, these numbers show us that on a monthly basis, we average out right around $960 in these repairs. That doesn't mean we're paying $960 every month. That just means we have that set aside. Just in case down the line, once once our, once our we do have a repair that costs more than $240 a month, you know, you are prepared. For example, if you have a boiler issue or you're getting your boiler serviced every year and you have water heater serviced every year, that might be around, I would say, to be safe, 300 bucks. If you have a water heater and a boiler for three units, that's 900 bucks right there, right? So that $900 chunk should be taken out of either your repairs or your CapEx, depending on how you run your numbers. But overall, our key, our key point here is just to show this property is at 250 with our rents at 24 when we rent it out or 16 when we live there. So we are technically minus 300 when we live here, but this should actually be 2,400. That's actually the wrong number. But 2,400, we minus our 1,900, we're at $500. And our $500 pick out our 960, we're still cash flow negative, essentially. And it comes down to, right, the income you have coming into the property. That's why it's extremely important to know, all right, just know the 1% rule and run them on every single property. Just get used to that. Since essentially in this area, you will have a lot of properties that are under-rented, tenants, long-term tenants with a verbal lease, that are paying way below market and you need to decide, well, if I turn it over, 
am I comfortable with kicking someone out who might be older and they've been here I don't know, 20 years, right? That's your job when you are taking over the building. Since the person who bought it 15, 20 years ago, they paid pennies compared to what properties are worth now. And they, they don't mind taking the rent on a lower rate because they're already cap. They paid so low for it. The mortgage is just getting, they just keep getting money every month, right? So hopefully this was helpful. Key takeaways, know the 1% rule. Know you will be paying the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance every month regardless. And then the key is to, another good point here is the expenses. Another rule, rule of thumb is the 50% rule. If your rent was 2,400, you could estimate roughly 1,200 a month for expenses. That is another quick tip, the 1% rule, the 50% rule. But overall, you also want to run the numbers if you're living in the property. They're going to be slightly different. You're not going to have property management. You're not going to be getting all the rent in. So keep analyzing. Keep looking for the 1% rule. And then once you understand that more, understand your down payment, understand how much you're going to be putting down, understand your closing costs, and start running numbers based on the PITI with your expenses. And that will kind of give you your monthly cash flow. Cash flow is the number that comes at the end. That is your income minus your expenses. So if our income was $2,400 and our expenses were $2,300 a month, <laughs> our cash flow would be $100 a month. I mean, that, that's, not, that's not great. $100 is, is pretty low, but it could be good depending on your area. Ideally, another rule of thumb, all these rules of thumbs, 100 bucks a door is a decent metric, which means we would want our expenses to be around $2,100 a month and our income around $2,400 a month. She gives us $100 per each door if this was a three family. So any questions, please leave a comment. I know it's a ton of information. If you've never actually looked at kind of buying a property, house hacking, using an FHA loan or mass housing if you're in Massachusetts, but stay consistent. Thanks for watching. If you haven't subbed, please sub. I know I'm creeping on 120, which is awesome and love showing people how they can start building wealth through real estate.